Gentlemen, what we have here is an instrument that uh, is useful for measuring the amount of energy taken up by this pendulum. As it goes through, one of these are small uh, plastic rods. Now, these plastic rods have been machined to uh, ASTM and uh, ASA standards. And the trick is the amount of impact uh, which they can support on this particular instrument is a, uh, is a valuable measurement in apprising the, uh, uh, the characteristics of various plastics. And you'll find uh, such uh, instruments in uh, most material testing's laboratory, particularly those that are interested in comparing different plastics. And in fact, the problem we're dealing with today is one in which we're comparing seven different kinds of, of plastics. Now, the way this instrument works is the following. As that pendulum goes through the rod, it will move this uh, little arrow, uh, and then we'll merely record the uh, reading here. Now, this is graduated from zero to uh, two in units of one hundredths. Uh, it's not graduated in degrees, but by a simple conversion, uh, we can translate the measurement, which we observe here, into the amount of energy absorbed uh, by the uh, uh, little plastic uh, rod there uh, as the pendulum goes through. Well, what do you say we try an example? Hey, let's, um, let's actually take a measurement. Okay, that's in there securely. Everybody ready? Here we go. And now we'll find out what the measurement is. It came out to be 0 0.45. And so for uh, specimen um, A23, we got a 0 0.45. And now it would be a matter of uh, taking this um, rod out and uh, replacing it by another rod and uh, going on with uh, these measurements. Can you imagine what it would be like if we were comparing a whole host of different kinds of plastics? Let's say, speaking in general terms, there were K plastics. And for each one of these plastics, we manufactured N of those little rods, and we checked them out on the impact tester, as we've just checked that one out. And we've recorded all the data, and we can see them in a tabular form, uh, in general terms, over here on the board. And now I want you to imagine a group of engineers trying to appraise such data and the wonderful arguments which crop up at this point in time like this. Uh, one thing which will become immediately obvious is where the big observations are, where the largest or the very smallest observations are. And the engineers will immediately start to argue about why that one was the very highest and why this one was the very lowest. Uh, then people will start uh, observing what goes on relative to these observations within their classification. Someone says, gee, look at all the high observations in treatment too. Uh, to which his uh, companion says, oh, now look, don't worry about the high observations in treatment two. Look at those high observations in treatment one. There are a couple in treatment one which are larger than the largest ones in treatment two. And then the other engineer says, yes, but treatment one has lower observations than there are in treatment two. And then somebody crops up and says, over here in treatment K, and uh, so the argument goes. It's very difficult indeed to appraise the information in a collection of data of that kind, although it's a perfectly balanced experimental design. And uh, let's hope that the engineers did, in fact, record those data randomly. About this time, someone says, for crying out loud, let's see what the averages are. And so we quickly would calculate the averages and look at them. And so here would be K averages, and now the arguments would start all over again. So I would say, hey, Treatment two, or plastic number two, is really better than all the other plastic because its average is higher than all the other averages. And the other engineer says, you're, no, that's, don't be silly, because some of the observations in treatment one are larger than that average in treatment two, and the average of treatment one isn't very far from the average of treatment two. And then somebody else would say, and look at the poor performance of treatment K. It's doing so miserably, its average is low, and then someone would find a high observation in that column, and the argument would wax and wane again. So it is generally when engineers get together and try to appraise data in company. What we really would like to do is to get some sort of objective uh, means for appraising the information in these data relative to those K different kinds of plastics. And in order for us to proceed objectively, one important statistic we must compute is that of the variance of the individual observations. Let's find out, if you will, what the intrinsic variability of the data is like. Now, to do that, the other statistics we'd have to calculate is the estimate of the variance within each of those K treatment classifications. And you can see, in general terms, uh, here are the K different S squares, uh, which have been separately estimated, separately calculated. Each of these S squares would, of course, be based on N minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right. 
What do you say, gang? We return to our actual problem, which we were trying to compare seven different kinds of plastics in terms of the impact test readings uh, which were taken on them. And so we're going to go to the board and see the seven averages and the seven estimates of the variance uh, which we uh, cooked up. And here they are over here. There were in all seven averages. There they are. And here are the seven independent, uh, individual uh, estimates of the variance. Each one of these averages is based on four observations. There are four little uh, uh, rods manufactured and tested in each case. And so as a consequence, each estimate of variance will have only uh, three degrees of freedom. All right, the next thing to do now is to get the pooled estimate of the variance. It's reasonable to assume that the variability that is intrinsic to the data taking process is the same for each one of the K classifications. So what do you say we aggregate or pool our individual estimates of the variance into a single estimate of the variance? Now you recall the formula for getting the pooled estimate of the variance. What we have to do in that case is take the weighted average of the individual S squares, the weights being their degrees of freedom. And so you'd have nu1 S1 squared plus nu2 S2 squared and so on divided down by the sum of the degrees of freedom. And you see that actual calculation uh, being done here uh, for the data which uh, we've recorded. Each of the individual estimates of the variance would be multiplied by their corresponding degrees of freedom. That quantity summed up, and then we'd sum down by the total number of degrees of freedom. And if we were going to go through that entire calculation, you'd find out that S squared was equal to 9. You would have 21 degrees of freedom. There are seven treatments, each providing three degrees of freedom for the estimate of the variance, 21 degrees of freedom. S squared would estimate sigma squared, the intrinsic of variability of the data. Now, in a sense, we're in good statistical shape because the statistic S squared and these seven averages really encapsulate all the essential information in the data when it comes to making comparisons between these treatments relative to their mean performances. But, as you all know, it's difficult to appraise numbers. Your mind sort of boggles when it sees all those data, and we'd be much better off having a plot. And so let's have a geometric display of what really lies in these data. And I happen to have plotted the averages here uh, on an appropriate scale. And so here we see the uh, plot of the averages. Uh, you will notice that uh, Treatment number seven had an average of 60, and treatments four and five both had an average of uh, 65, and treatment six had an average of 70, and there are the seven averages all displayed. Now really, if you want to compare the averages, this is the way to display the data. But imagine the arguments which ensue. Someone would say, I think that six is different from three. The average for treatment six is different from the average of treatment three. And you'd say, well, the averages are different. That's obvious. But are the means different? Is treatment three really different from treatment six in terms of its mean performance? Because actually, what we have here are averages, and averages vary. They've been composited from the variable observations which we took. And so what we really need here to properly appraise these averages is their reference distribution. All right? Well, now, what's the reference distribution for averages? And you're all supposed to chorus back. The reference distribution for averages is a normal distribution with a mean eta and a variance sigma squared over n. So let's put that up right away. The reference distribution for averages is, as we all well know, is a normal with mean eta and variance sigma squared over n. But of course, we don't know sigma squared. And so what does that do to the reference distribution for the averages? It turns it into a T distribution. That T distribution looks a lot like a normal. It's located there at eta, but it's scaled by S squared over N instead of by sigma squared over N. Now, what we want to do is construct this reference distribution, this T reference distribution. Now, when you're dealing with the T distribution, the points that are tabulated in the tables are those points which leave 2.5% in the tail of the curve. So what we have to do is find that position, which leaves 2.5% in the tail of the appropriate T distribution. Now, what T distribution will we be dealing with in this case? Well, it depends on what S squared is. Now, S squared, in this instance, turned out to be 9 with 21 degrees of freedom. So we're particularly interested in getting a hold of the uh, T distribution uh, with 21 degrees of freedom. And let's see if we can find out what that is. I've got to look up the critical value of T with 21 degrees of freedom. That value of T which leaves 2.5% in the tail of the curve. Well, that will be in my uh, textbook over here. So let's go over and pick up this statistical text. 
This is a very famous disco text, incidentally, General, and this is uh, Cochrane and Cox, a uh, superlative book on the design of experiments. And I'm looking up T with 21 degrees of freedom, leaves 2.5% in the tail of the curve. R, it comes out to be 2.08. You know, when you get the number of degrees of freedom way up, up or over 15 or something like that, T is to all practical purposes equal to 2. And that's always easy to remember. 2 for T and T for 2. It's no problem. So at any rate, 2.08 is our value. And so what I'm going to do now is take my critical value of T, which was equal to 2.08. It's a T with 21 degrees of freedom. And uh, put it into this particular formula. There's the critical value of T times the scaling factor. And if you do that, you get 2.08, see? And then you've got to scale it, see, by the square root of s squared over n, 9 over 4. And that will turn out to be plus or minus 3.12. So what I really will have now is a t curve. It looks like a normal. And the distance from the mean out to the point that leaves 2.5% in the tail of the curve will be 3.12 units, OK? Well, I just happen to have one of those uh, constructed here. And here she is. So here is the appropriate reference distribution for our averages. You will note here that the distance from the mean out to a point that leaves 2.5% in the tail of the curve is just slightly greater than 3 units. And so there's the appropriate reference distribution right there. You really have no prior knowledge of where it's located, but uh, observe the following, gang. Can you locate this reference distribution in any position such that all seven of those averages appear to be members of the same distribution? And the answer is no. You can try hard as you will. You can't locate that distribution in such a way that all those averages seem to be spawned by the same parent distribution. That's a definite indication that there are real differences among the treatment means, you see? The averages vary, to be sure, but do the means vary? And we can declare now that we feel that the means vary because it seems unlikely that seven averages could have been spawned from the same a reference distribution. Well, that's a test of what's called the null hypothesis. The hypothesis is that there's nothing going on among those seven treatment means. If that hypothesis were true, then I could have located the, the reference distribution in one position, and all seven of the averages would have been part of the distribution. But that didn't happen, of course. But that's a sort of subjective test, this geometric uh, view that we've just given you of the data. Could we do that more exactly? And the answer is yes, we could have set up an analysis of variance.